So someone said out there, you know, welcome to California, but don't move here. <laughs> um, I, I'm a native San Franciscan, and I have to say, um, it is great living here, and I'm, I'm, I encourage all of you to, to uh, consider the Bay Area as a home. All right, so uh, thanks, Jim Zemlin. Jim and I have worked together and uh, stayed in touch for about 20 years now. We worked together at Covalent, as Jim mentioned. Um, Jim impressed me there in, in his marketing capacity, and he has gone on to do wonderful things here at, at the, the Linux Foundation. So I congratulate Jim on, on all his success. Oh, you're right there. Congratulations, Jim. OK. So Patrick and I have known each other for a number of years. Uh, when Patrick was the chief security officer at Salesforce, uh, he considered uh, the Fortify product suite. Um, he goes back to McKesson, as Jim mentioned. And, and uh, Dropbox was your last Dropbox. commercial uh, endeavor. And now is a venture capitalist at a firm called ClearSky. I've, I've escaped the CISO wheel of pain. Yes. We, as we used to say in the commercial side, now you've gone to the dark side. You're an investor. Right. But it's OK. Um, so Patrick and I worked on some topics together that we think will be of interest to all of you in the room. So I'm going to act as the uh, facilitator here. And I'm going to ask Patrick about our first topic. And this is the one we, we want to start at a, a very high level and, and get your views on the growing security risks as individuals, as corporations, as a nation. I've even heard you use a metaphor of a stealth bomber and all that, so I'm looking forward to hearing yeah. that. The, uh, hopefully we're not insulting anybody in the audience here because you're like living and breathing security on a daily basis and it's inescapable in the news. But fundamentally, I think the game has changed over the last several years in a very visible way. And uh, yeah, let me start with the stealth bomber side. So let's, let's talk about nation state threats. And we see it in the news about uh, North Korea engaging in various hacking activities. We've heard about uh, you know, the US potentially collaborating with Israel on the attacks against the Iranian uh, nuclear facilities, which are cyber attacks, et cetera. But you, you think about it, you know, it's like, why is this so compelling? Why is cyber as an attack vehicle so compelling? And I like to think of things in terms of economics. And currently, you know, if you, if you Google how much does a B-2 stealth bomber cost, it's about $2 billion per bomber, I think it is. Think about how many really smart developers you can hire, stick in a room, and basically say, go hack something for $2 billion. So in the grand scheme of nation state budgets that are being spent in terms of military, it makes perfect sense. And it also, in a way, I hate to say it is a democratizing effect. It doesn't take many really, really smart people to develop an offensive capability. So even small countries that don't have conventional resources, they can't afford the B-2 stealth bombers, they surely can basically mentor, grow, train, and develop kind of like cyber offensive forces. I hate to use the word cyber. You know, it's like old school guys uh, don't like to use it, but it's, it's so much in the vocabulary nowadays. So that's, that's one dynamic, which is the, the nation state side of the attack is very real. Uh, we've seen it play out also with uh, Russia and Ukraine X number of months ago, attacking the power grids and taking it down. So there is a very growing sense of paranoia here in the United States, especially, but globally as well, on how to deal with this kind of like the, the new reality of global cyber war. God, that sounds scary. Um, but the challenges that, that, that we face there are not just on the kind of like the government side. I think it extends into people's lives as well. And having come from the healthcare world, uh, CISO uh, Kaiser Permanente for a period of time, um, you'll learn that there is an amazing amount of vulnerability and opportunity to attack and to cause damage, not only to uh, dollars and data. You know, it's like in the past, I would say the impact of many of these attacks was that um, you lose money, or there's a privacy issue, and there's an uproar, and people get paid off, or you get signed up for like a free years of credit monitoring, and the world moves on. I think that's changing because the dependency on devices, whether it's medical devices or IoT devices, the consequences are becoming physical consequences that are not easy to compensate. Um, again, if we project into the future now, there's a lot written about this with autonomous vehicles. You know, it's like okay. You know, what are some of the horror scenarios you can think about if you have a compromise of autonomous vehicles crashing, et cetera, with um, the healthcare space? You know, we did some tests even 10 years ago. Uh, we were able to alter infusion pumps via the network, hack into them, and deliver fatal, potentially fatal doses of uh, medication. These are all life-changing scenarios. And uh, what's really interesting is many of these devices and systems underneath are actually powered by open source software uh, as they're being pushed into the marketplace. 
And as I'm still monologuing, you know, I'll, I talk a little bit about kind of like the internet of things and kind of why it's concerning to me. And the best way to maybe frame it is to put it in the context of a network connected fridge, um, which is kind of a, I don't know, I consider it to be a silly device. But let's assume you just bought a network connected fridge and you think about it as a refrigerator. And ask yourself, how long do you expect this refrigerator to be operational in your house before you basically replace it with something. It's probably you know, like 10, 15 years after that it gets too grody and maybe you have an efficiency problem or a refrigerant leak or something like that and you have to replace it. So a refrigerator is a durable good that has a relatively long expected lifetime um, from a consumer perspective. But if you look at the embedded component, it basically probably has a little Android-based tablet sitting in the front and a few sensors inside. But if you look at the embedded compute component that's built into that durable good, Ask yourself which consumer electronics company has actually demonstrated their ability to maintain technology designed for the consumer market for more than three years. You know, we've created a disposable culture around technology in the consumer space. And what happens when you don't maintain something anymore? And you know, I, I, I have this principle I developed, which is that if you want to maintain reasonable security of a system, you have to monitor and maintain it for the duration that it is connected to a network. So as soon as that, as soon as that monitoring, the maintenance, the patching stops, which should be a function of the uh, manufacturer, you have a security problem. So you know what's happening? I, I kind of like to think, I'm being a little bit alarmist, that we're kind of driving to a cliff. We have a lot of saturation of these low security quality IoT devices that are going to be sticking around in people's homes and, and in businesses for maybe decades that are not going to be maintained. We know that the embedded components are not going to be maintained, so they will become exploitable eventually. Good news is there are a lot of vendors basically fighting to play in that space of IoT security. And if, if, we, um, if we go back to the, to the nation state, though, I think a yeah. lot of, a lot of uh, the average consumer, average citizen thinks of nation state uh, attacks as you know military against the grid, those kind of things. But you have nations like China, to, to point to one, that the government and the commercial sector work together in order to advance the causes of the commercial sector. So, the, so the, Im the impact is not just do we need to fear these nation states in terms of military defense protection, but it's also do we need to fear them? Well, it's been proven we need to fear them around the economy as well. No, that's been a huge issue. And I remember um, shortly, you know, God, if you remember the Aurora attacks, they were called. And this is when China compromised Google. That was, at least for the tech sector, that was a bit of a wake-up call. That was a big changing moment. And I remember at Salesforce, it really drove um, security and trust being the number one priority of the company. It drove an immense amount of effort and focus, which is this can't happen to us, especially in the cloud business as a provider. It's like massively degrading trust if an event like that happens. So you know, the reality is that the, the espionage element of it, it's probably more limited in terms of the number of threat actors that are out there, but it's still very clearly apparent in terms of economic espionage. But what we're also seeing is clearly the more traditional espionage against nation states. And if you read the press this uh, last week, I believe there's a bunch of evidence of uh, Russians having compromised uh, German government networks. So it's, the, the economics are too compelling not to do this. Yeah. The systems are too vulnerable, and it's too cheap and easy to do it to not do it. Yeah, for sure. OK, well, let's, let's bring it down then to the topic that's of interest to the room specifically, which is open source. Um, many say that the debate between the closed source world where there, are some argue, where there are some that would argue that total control and open source world where there are many eyes, you know, this many eyes debate. What does this mean in terms of security of open source? Who's responsible? How should the eventual consumers of open source think about security when they use open yeah. source products? I, I think there's been this ongoing debate, um, you know, which is better, closed source, open source, whatnot. And, uh, <sighs> I don't know if it's settled yet, and you know maybe I want to poke you guys and make you a little bit angry at me, but I don't think there's a lot of evidence that the many eyes is actually working. Um, I saw a report recently, I read it, but I think it was published by the Department of Homeland Security where they did an analysis, and they basically said that, yeah, you know, the open of the many eyes is not as effective as we'd like to see it, and there is some benefit to actually having the obscurity of having a closed source product. And I think one of the one of the events that illustrates this is uh, 
you know, last year when we had the vulnerabilities around OpenSSL, the Heartbleed vulnerabilities as they were called, it's open source. There are hopefully many eyes looking at this. That was the theory, but they weren't. So I, I think there's still a challenge around, uh, and maybe we need to move beyond the argument of which is better. We just need to figure out how do we manage risk in, in both, kind of like both situations. Open source is here to stay, it's one. And it's like I you know, say, you know, Linux is the new data center platform. Um, every company I look at that's doing some interesting networking product, it's based on um, x86 hardware with uh, Linux running on it. So the, the proprietary world is shrinking in terms of uh, kind of like core especially. Uh, so you know, the question is, how do we live in this new world where we know that there is a growing dependency on open source software, and we know that kind of the, the many eyes, that this is somehow self-regulating and that smart people will look at it and find vulnerabilities. I think the evidence is that it's not working as we may have wanted it to work. So we have to think slightly differently about how we manage risk in this type of a world. What, what about these uh, uh, open source projects that are coming out now? Facebook has, has some, yeah. some stuff. Google has I, some stuff. It's very heartening. I mean, there's security in terms of securing the code of like other open source projects, and then there are like open source security projects. And it's, it's actually really cool to see many of the large tech companies like Facebook open sourcing, uh, say Facebook case, it's OS Query. And I know that uh, Netflix and a number of other companies, they're developing tool sets internally, and they look at these and basically go, you know, we're building security tools, but they're not core to our business, so let's share those with a broader community. And then you see uptake on those. And then you see commercialization, such as I've seen several companies now that have taken OS Query and wrapped it with manageability co uh, components so that other industries that aren't very very heavy in terms of having their own engineering teams can take advantage of that. So I, I, I'm really heartened by kind of the open sourcing of security tools by very skilled security teams, security engineering teams. Um, the other issue, though, is I think uh, less addressed right now, which is like the actual integrity and the quality of the code of all the other kind of just open source projects as a whole and rely, your ability to rely on them. Well, how do, how do we... Uh... If you think of the, the company that Jim mentioned that I was the CEO of called Fortify was a commercially yeah. uh, built product to scan code and look for vulnerabilities and then provide uh, ideas on remediation yeah. of such. And you know, we would sell that typically to commercial enterprises and they could enforce rules. You had to go to training, you had to use this tool, your output would be evaluated based on what the tool told you about your code the code could not go in production until a certain level of security you know, what, what was achieved, just like we've always had a certain level of quality, a certain level of performance. But in this open source world, what, what's the responsibility of the developer then, when, when, given that there isn't this kind of yeah. Uber uh, enforcement taking place? So it's responsibility and or measurement as well. So, is every developer gonna have the same sense of responsibility? Do they, do they think about my code is going to end up as a module that's powering a battleship and has national security implications? Probably not. So I think the question is, how do we drive more visibility? How do we enable the organizations that are building on these open source components to have better visibility into the quality and sustainability of that code that's happening? So love the concept of you know, like source code vulnerability scanning. There are all kinds of other things that can be done, including like dependency scanning of libraries, trying to see you know, uh, the distribution, which ones are vulnerable or not. There are companies like SourceClear that are basically building businesses on this, or Black Duck as well as moving in that direction. That's all really exciting. The question is, how do we pull this together so that if you're building an open source application, a larger one, that uh, I'd almost like to say basically is like I have only used components that have a tier one trust score of some kind, and then back off and look at um, some kind of composite metric on the components that say that uh, is this actively being maintained? In other words, do I see commits happening on a regular basis? Has this gone through vulnerability scanning? You know, have we done a full dependency check on this thing? Uh, is there maybe a corporate sponsor or somebody more accountable? But you know, it's like I, I think there is an opportunity for the open source community to really come together and put some metrics, KPIs, other things around these reusable components so that the individuals and companies that are building on these libraries and tools, um, they can see basically there is more transparency as to the trustworthiness. What about, the, uh, what about these, these commercial uh, uh, attacks that are happening like ransomware and, yeah. th and things like that? What, what, what are your thoughts there and how, do we, how does the 
community respond to those kind of attacks? I'm, I'm going to go back to economics. Uh, so it's, it's about attack surface and the ability to make money. Uh, ransomware and or Bitcoin are awesome because you know you can completely disintermediate an entire very complicated criminal supply chain and go directly from compromise to profit. You know, so it's like it's a trend that we're not going to see reverse itself. I think we're going to continue to see both destructive attacks and also kind of these direct monetization attacks, if you want to call them ransomware related attacks. Um, how does that affect the open source community? I mean, right now. I would say prepare for it because you know it's been targeting the Windows desktop and end user environments. You know you go where the money is, but um, you know let's assume that uh, some clever security companies and maybe Microsoft can figure out how do they restrict that ability. Uh, maybe it's at the file system level so that you know you have reversing capabilities that negate this, et cetera. Um, so if that happens, the attacker is going to shift elsewhere. So you know what's next? And like I said earlier, I you know I really think that especially Linux has one in the contemporary data center. I mean, even I can't remember what it is, but a large percentage of even the machines running in Microsoft's uh, Azure cloud are Linux machines. So it's like you're going to go where the money is, and who knows? Maybe they'll move upstream away from. Uh, attacking the desktop and individual end users to attacking the infrastructure, holding it for ransom. So the accountability again of uh, open source developers, you know, it's like, you know, it's it's a vulnerability. You know, it's like manage your vulnerabilities. Uh, but there's an old adage which I think comes from Microsoft, which is if the bad guy can run his code on your system, it's not your system anymore. So and it, you know, it's like, and the question of the impact is really how creative the bad guy is. So you know, ransomware is just kind of one instantiation of creativity where, like I said, they've disintermediated the criminal supply chain, have gone directly from compromise to profit. Hmm. Interesting. What um, we've read in the news and we've heard uh, about the uh, specter and meltdown, yeah. and uh, just curious on what your views are of uh, what happened there, how the response was, the, yeah. the uh, notification has been a little yeah. controversial. I, I think there are a couple of interesting trends here to look at. I mean, one of them is there's a shift towards more scrutiny at the hardware level, uh, which I think is good. I'm, I'm glad researchers are paying attention to this, and which is also causing more scrutiny to the hardware manufacturers themselves. And uh, you know, I, I, I don't have inside knowledge in terms of how everything was negotiated with uh, Intel and AMD and the other chip manufacturers with some of these vulnerabilities. Um, but clearly, I think there are going to be some very interesting lessons learned because it doesn't seem like there was a lot of muscle memory there to make that a very smooth process. Um, it's, it's concerning that uh, certain open source projects like uh, OpenBSD, for example, uh, who are very security focused, were left out of that kind of like negotiation uh, ring, kind of like the I don't know, circle, of, uh, circle of trust, basically, which is uh, very interesting. I think that needs to be reevaluated as well as, um, again, as an outsider, it looks like just the quality of design. I mean, I, I would just basically put a call out to the open source community to, be, to hold themselves accountable by putting metrics and KPIs in place. But I think uh, maybe this will be a turning point as well to look at uh, the hardware manufacturers because they have such an amazing amount of power and impact uh, to the overall system security and maybe drive a higher degree of transparency into kind of what some of those risks are and even into the, into the process that uh, they're using for building some of these uh, kind of new chipsets. Um, the other side of this is maybe less so on the pure hardware side, but there's something in the middle that we're also seeing, which is maybe the attackers trending towards uh, firmware, BIOS, whatnot. Um, uh, you know, it's like the UEFI BIOS. It's like if you, if you look at the BIOS from X number of years ago, it was this horrible little CLI, not command line interface, but text interface. And nowadays, you have these rich graphical interfaces basically for computer biases. And you've got to wonder how many lines of code are driving that and what kind of attack surface is there and what opportunities does that open up. And when I reflect back to my time as being a CISO of large environments, um, good God, I would not want to have to touch the BIOS. And it's like the whole concept of like proactively going up and updating and patching BIOSes. Um, it's like, let's, let's put our fingers in our ears and hum la 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 so we don't have to think about this because just managing patches at the OS and the application layer was tough enough. But I think we're slowly being forced into kind of like expanding our set of priorities to focus more on the hardware as well, having knowledge around hardware layer vulnerabilities, uh, having knowledge around uh, BIOS versions and what, the, what opportunity those create. And there's, there is evidence, again, that uh, especially at the nation state level, that uh, within the supply chain and other places, uh, BIOSes are being corrupted. And if 
we kind of go back and I said that you know there's a destructive element to some of these attacks. Uh, what better way of causing damage than to just brick systems by corrupting the bios in a way that it can't be recovered easily? Yeah, we're gonna we're gonna have time for a few questions. So if you think of something you'd like to ask, Patrick, um, we have about nine minutes left. I have a couple more questions, then we'll open up for a few from the audience. What one question I have that's off script, sorry, is. Um, uh, there are companies represented out here, and, and you've had a ton of experience as, as a CISO, Chief Information Security Officer. How, what, what advice would you give to a company on just at, you know, at the 30,000 foot level of how do you think about protection, how do you think about detection, how do you think about remediation in today's world? So my general bit of CISO advice is prioritize everything. I, um, it's, it's, it's like we talk about the attack surface being almost unbounded, almost infinite, basically. That's kind of true. So you do have to really understand your business risk and prioritize and be willing to ignore stuff that just, quite frankly, isn't that important. And as part of that prioritization, um, kind of work with the business so they understand and basically say, look, here's what I'm going to be able to focus on and maybe risk that I can address, and here's the rest of the universe that we know about but we're not going to be able to work on for lack of resources and other constraints. So I think uh, having an honest conversation with the business around priorities and risk management would be my, my number one bit of like uh, CISO advice. The other thing in terms of maybe being a little bit more open source focused, I'm really excited around the whole uh, DevSecOps movement, which is, um, you know, I don't know how, how much everybody knows here, but basically the whole concept of you know the integrating security into the CI/CD pipelines, not security being outside of development and outside of operations, pointing at the problems, but being part of the process, both for software development and operations, is really exciting. And I'm seeing companies like, um, oh gosh, I'm blanking right now, but there are a number of companies that are basically creating enforcement along that pipeline where you can integrate a variety of tools, a variety of checks, make sure everything passes before anything is pushed. Make sure you look at all the library dependencies, that they're updated, and then as everything is tested. So there's, there's, there's um, Cyber, that's the company I'm thinking of, and there are a number of other ones as well. So there's a, there's a good movement going on that's trying to make, um, that's trying to create a sense of sustainability, especially uh, on development on top of open source system using kind of these DevSecOps philosophies. And my last question is uh, that it concerns all of us in this room as individuals is what do you do to protect yourself? What can we learn from that? <laughs> um, number one thing you can do as an individual is use two-factor authentication. I'm a huge fan of YubiKeys. Okay, <laughs> thank you for the applause. Now, seriously, if you look at the data, it's like what are all, what do individual compromises come down to? It's not crazy zero-day nation-state attacks. You know, it's not like ninjas coming in and trying to kill you in the middle of the night. It's simple stupidity of reusing the same password across multiple sites. Uh, one of those sites happens to get hacked, and the bad guys then test that password they have access to across all the other known websites. And you know, we saw a lot of evidence of this testing activity. It's always going on, and then they have access to your accounts. So um, I'm not even going to tell you to use smart passwords. Just turn on two-factor authentication wherever you can. And for those sites that don't support it, make sure you use uh, really solid random passwords. And I personally use a tool called LastPass, which generates them and manages them and pushes them into browsers. Uh, you can also argue that's a risk in itself, but that's a risk I'm willing to take when I combine it with two-factor authentication. That's number one piece of consumer advice, use two-factor. Great. I use LastPass, too. So do we have any questions? Mr. Zemlin. Yeah. I'm going to hog these questions. Uh, no, I just have one question because you, you keyed in on something and keep in mind that we talk about this idea of open source projects that are then productized and you know companies will then sell those and create value and then reinvest back into these projects. A lot of people here are uh, in charge of productizing open source and in that supply chain, they're indemnifying, they're taking responsibility. But now you're saying, well, hey, that upstream has to take responsibility too. And there's some people in here who are in those upstream projects that might counter argue and say, hey, the license is pretty clear here, as is no warranty, right? <laughs> and, it, and it sounds like, you know, Martin Mikos was here from HackerOne on Tuesday and, you know, was saying it's everyone's responsibility. Mm -hmm. It sounds like we've moved from sort of the law, which is as is no warranty, into this social norm of, listen, we are all in a pretty bad spot. 
What, what can folks who are in industry here productizing open source do to kind of help these upstream projects be aware of this responsibility, provide incentives for them to, to mm -hmm. do this, to kind of help them in, in that, that world? What, what ideas do you have around that? Wow, incentivizing them. You want to take that one? Well, I, <laughs> to me, the irony of that whole situation is uh, if you're developing an open source component, you're very prideful that it works, mm -hmm. right? You, you are very focused on functionality. And the reality is in today's world, functionality and performance have to, be, have to go side by side with security. So it's, it's almost like you can incentivize, but it's almost like you, there has to be this mind shift that it doesn't work if it's not secure. Right. It, it, it can do what it's designed to do over and over again, but if someone can hack into it and, and, and take advantage of it, then it doesn't work. And that's, to me, that's the irony of the situation. Mm -hmm. it, security, it doesn't work unless it's secure. I think my comment was step one before we even think about incentives is just having knowledge. So you know, looking at that uh, dependency tree that's there, looking and uh, you know, whether there are old versions of libraries that are embedded. You know, we, we, as a venture firm, you know, we do analysis of source trees as part of diligence, and we even find security companies, like, why are you running an old version of this library? You know, it's just like, the, the, in some cases, the, the muscle memory, if you want to call it, or the process maturity around maintaining currency and going back into all of these different open source projects um, just isn't there, and the tool set may not be there to enable them to do that. And that's why I was saying I'm actually really enthusiastic about what I'm seeing with DevSecOps, where it's changing some of that dynamic, so you have continuous updates of better components and visibility into the risks. Jeff Borick. Jeff Borick with IBM, thanks for being here. Uh, follow up on your point about the, I don't want to say you characterize it as a myth, but the old convention that uh, many eyes on open source make for a secure ecosystem. Can you pull the thread on that just a bit more and get to the next level of detail? Do you feel that's because it's just ultimately the amount of volume of open source that's creating a problem that uh, many eyes can't keep up with? Um, the question is, who are those many eyes? So are there, I mean, there are obviously like Project Zero at Google where people are looking at very significant open source projects and that, you know, they're basically saying, this is good for humanity, we're gonna invest in that, which is phenomenal. But um, I, I would say, let's maybe up-level it. And one of the biggest challenges in the security world right now is that there really aren't enough skilled, qualified individuals, especially within the space of application security. And those that are there, especially in the Bay Area, are highly compensated by companies that they work for. So you know, it's like if we peel this many eyes argument back, I would ask, who has the skills to look at and analyze in depth and verify and find bugs in open source products? And then who is incented to do so and who actually does it? And it's probably a relatively small, and we can think about it in Venn diagram, a small group of individuals. So I do think there's maybe, um, you know, we can take the lead that Google has basically, I think industry that is relying and building on open source, uh, maybe they have to create some economic incentives to take these individuals uh, because it does come down to that and tools like Fortify basically, and basically say, hey, you know, it's like our contribution and maybe IBM has a role to play in that, our contribution to the open source community is to actually pay for people to look at this. And clearly it's maybe not everything in the open source universe, maybe it's the most core projects, the most, uh, the ones that everybody relies on. Again, you can do the dependency analyses and identify kind of what those are that are actually being used, and you can apply some science to figure out where you put your resources. But in my mind, I think that's the call. One more question. Oh, hi. Uh, I'd like to follow up on that. Um, you mentioned earlier that you thought there was some advantage to uh, obscurity, insecurity. I'd, I'd like to take issue with that. Um, mainly because of one of the things you just said, yeah. which was when you were doing due diligence, one of the things you did was analyze the source code. Mm -hmm. If you're using proprietary components, there's no way to do that. So I agree with you about the many eyes. Um, people only look at your code if they're interested or if they're trying to break it. Uh, nobody you know, volunteers to go and security yeah. review something. But uh, given open source components, what that means is that they have an advantage in that people who do have security tools and who want to examine the code for flaws 
can do so. Um, and the security tools I'm hoping are getting better and better. My, my big hope is that the intersection of machine learning with uh, vulnerability analysis will actually create a massive automated scanning machine that will, that will find the vulnerabilities before the bad guys, or probably the bad guys are already doing this. Um, but I, I think proprietary components simply can't take advantage of that. Um, the only way you can get to take advantage of that is I, by... I think I was very careful code. in my wording to not step in the middle of this debate and get stabbed on the way out by saying <laughs> it was a DHS report that made that statement, that conclusion. So, <laughs> now, this has been a long, ongoing battle, and both sides, I think, have very valid points. But again, for, you know, for what it's worth, from an attacker's perspective, it's maybe slightly more difficult for me to attach to a binary and try to find vulnerabilities and do black box testing than if I had open source to test against. But so it's, it's again, I'm not going to step in the middle of this debate. Uh, that's why I referenced kind of the, the external report on that. And I also said, basically, regardless of where the reality is, I don't know if it necessarily matters. It's just the open source community has to look towards itself to how do we improve the quality overall. All right, thank you very much, Patrick. Thank you all for your attention.